Welcome to MicroWorks Talks. I'm your host, Xavier Gallego, VP of Brand and Marketing, and I'm delighted to take you with me on our journey to grow the future of materials. Thank you for tuning in. In today's episode, we talk to Sophia Wang, co-founder and chief of culture here at MicroWorks. We will discover how she went from being a PhD in poetry at UC Berkeley to being honored as one of the conscious fashion campaign leaders and how she feels about being portrayed in a billboard at Times Square. So stay tuned and let's get started. Hello, Sophia. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's so good to have you here today. I know that we have a lot of things to talk about, but it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, same. This is going to be fun. So the first question that I ask to the people is, uh, when was the first time that you heard the word mycelium? That's really easy for me to pinpoint because (laughs) I had never heard this word before I met our co-founder, Phil Ross. So this was back in 2007. 2007. Yep. I met Phil through a mutual friend in our artist community here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Phil was looking for an artist assistant, and I signed on for the job and got to know Phil's art practice, which, as you've discussed on this podcast series, (laughs) entails working with mycelium as a living material for sculpture and design. So, of course, I knew mushrooms. I was a huge fan of them myself for food and actually the first, and art too, the first print that I ever made in college in 2D design was a woodcut block print of a large mushroom. Wow, so you were <laughs> destined. I was destined. And so what happened like the, when you hear the word, like what was the first thing that you did? You know, I'm a very thirsty learner. Anytime there's someone around me who knows something that I don't, I become a student instantly. So I want to hear everything that they have to say about it. So Phil is, of course, a great teacher in this regard. And so, you know, describing mycelium, showing me his artworks that he'd created with mycelium was basically the best way to understand what this new material was, was just to feel it in your hands and to, and to smell it, look at it, see see the different shapes it could make. Very practical. Yes. I'm hands-on. I got like the more theoretical description, (laughs) but you got like the hands-on. Yeah. You look at the art objects, which is, you know, the important function of art sometimes is to make visible something that you might only otherwise understand as a concept or an idea. Make visible the invisible. Yes. That's what we do. That's so awesome. Well, coming from where you're coming from, right? Like the, the student and then we created this company organism, kind of like art project called MicroWorks. Yeah. Yeah. You transitioned from many, many positions. I did. Tell me and tell us what you've, <laughs> what you've done since the creation of Michael. Was it in 2016 or 13? It was 2013. So can you give me an overview of all the positions that you had? Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing arc. <laughs> so <laughs> we founded the company in 2013. And at that point... I would say we didn't have any official titles, but, you know, Phil bringing what he was bringing and me bringing what I was bringing, I was basically operational. I was like the operations person and also, you know, relationships and, oh, sort of back end things like trying to figure out like how to actually turn an art studio practice into a company. Mm. Sounds like a big transition to me. It it was, and you know, it was really fun because you, you know you're you're just researching things like what kind of corporate entity we should be, which sounds very dry, but it actually is like a whole world of information and relationships that I'd never had time to think about in my you know years as a PhD student and studying poetry. So, (laughs) you know, I'm always really curious about learning new systems. And so this was just a whole new world. So, so, you know, first couple of years, I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, partner operational. And then, um, around 2016, we joined this biotech accelerator program called Indie Bio. 
And we had to sort of formalize our roles a bit in order to enter the program because that's essentially what it was. It was like formalize your your roles and your path and your work as a startup. And so at that point, I stepped forward as CEO because, you know, the, the roles have to be extremely clear when you're trying to do a billion things and there's just a couple of you. Wow. So what triggers the creation of the company in 2013? Who decided to participate in Indivio? Like, do you remember those moments? Yeah, I do. So the founding of the company was inspired by all the opportunities that Phil was starting to field as a result of having worked with mycelium as an art material and then increasingly as a design material for, you know, practical design objects like furniture and, and building, basically for, you know, since the 90s. So around 2009, 10, 11, you know, Phil's getting interest from companies around the world that want to use mycelium in their products. And so Phil approached me as, you know, a collaborator that, you know, we'd had successful working relationships in the art world, producing events, you know, thinking together as, you know, creative partners, approached me as a co-founder to, you know, complement what he was bringing to the project. So that was the inspiration for joining the company, which was companies were coming to us for, opportunities and you know you can't partner as an individual as an artist with a multinational global company so you have to become a company yourself in order to meet those opportunities and as far as joining indie bio you know the first two years in a startup are sometimes what they call like the valley of death or the trough of sadness (laughs) (laughs) it sounds really exciting (laughs) it's a hard time it's it's exciting but you're you know, you're working your day job, you're borrowing money from your dad, you're fielding all the hopes and dreams and fears of your friends and family and community who've seen you struggle for a long time to get something going and funding is is like your number one need. So it's it's hard. And so we joined Indie Bio because it was going to be some structured support, both financially and in terms of advisorship for the young company to sort of get us going and sort of acclimate us and acculturate us into the world of being startup entrepreneurs. And Phil and I were both artists, academics, coming from a very different world. I can imagine that you both uh, made a lot of mistakes that you could learn from. Do you remember any moment that you say like, oh my God, (laughs) that this is like an advice for for the future generation? Well, I can share a mistake that we very easily avoided, Yeah, which was an early, I think we were looking for legal advice around forming the company and we reached out to someone who'd been recommended to us who's a lawyer and and he looked at what we had and, and gave us a proposal where he's like, well, all right, let's do this together. I will own 50% of the company and you and Phil will own the other part. And we, we just, we knew that that wasn't right. Mm, yeah, it sounds about yeah. the one that can be like, giving away <laughs> We everything. could have had a very different path. Yeah, wow. Um, but I would say that there were other things that happened along that lines along the way that were learning experiences for me as far as being a woman in this space and a founder with equal standing in this space. And I think I made choices and concessions in the early years that I would not make today. Wow, strong. Can you point me out at any or like do we keep it secret? <laughs> Some of that is behind the scenes business <laughs> yeah, about uh, the agreements you come to in, in forming a company. But um, I think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I remember like 2017, my joins, right? Like after Indivio. So Indivio was positive. The exposure that we all got with the Microworks company and what we were doing was pretty much understood. And then there's a, that amazing video that uh, you're doing the pitch and showing to the crowd uh, the, the cowhide size uh, sheet of reishi. I have a question about that moment because I've been asking you all the time, like, how does it feel to show, to be like almost like Steve Jobs showing the iPod, no? <laughs> like in a really small, small, small scale. But, uh, but that's a moment where you show something that nobody is expecting. Yeah, it, I mean, it was it was really fun and rewarding and terrifying. I should say that I have a background as a dancer and a performer. So a long time ago, dealt with my feelings around stage fright and being in public and also, you know, like teaching at Berkeley for 10 years, you know, lecturing to that undergrads. Helps. Yeah, that, that helps. helps, you know, try, <laughs> try to keep undergrads attention. I approached that pitch day as a performance opportunity 
that would really draw from a lot of my skills and experience as a performer. So, you know, it's very theatrical. Like what Steve Jobs does is that's theater. I mean, you got lighting design and the stage and the setting and the audience and the music and the like dramatic effects and then the big reveal. I mean, it's, it's entertainment, you know? (laughs) It must be really rewarding to get the crowd excited or just like cheering or saying things to you. And after the, the, the presentation, probably you got approached by a lot of people. We did because it, you know, there's nothing like seeing an actual piece of material that you've grown. I mean, that's more impactful than an idea or a story in a way because you can feel it, it's weight in your hands and see the size and tell the story. So yeah, yeah I mean, that that sparked us on a whole journey, like a whole like about a year long journey of meeting with and pitching to investors all around the Bay Area. Yeah, and you, you made you make visible the invisible again, no? Yes. Like you made like, yeah. but it seemed impossible. You you show it to the crowd. So yep. that's a milestone. So you were doing operations. You became the CEO. Yep. And now, like after Matt joins and the story that we told in the first episode, you are the chief of culture. Yes. And what does that mean? Chief of culture means, and, and I should say it's a title that we have invented for me, yeah, but I, I, do <laughs> see I, it, I do see it increasingly in other organizations. So I think it's a testament to, you know, the world at large, recognizing the important role that culture plays in your business strategy and your relationships within the company and without the company. So for me, chief of culture is about ensuring that the company as it grows and scales is always grounded in values that we as the team have agreed upon and that evolve organically as the company evolves. There's always going to be a through line as long as I'm involved because the founding values are powerful for this company. Yeah, They're deeply tied to the founding story, having been founded by artists, um, bringing an art practice into a materials development space. So for me, it's about naming the values, like involving the whole team in, in signing onto the values and then operationalizing those values. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can, I can feel those values. Uh, recently the be mycelial, it's, it's something that I, I believe because they're actionable. Like you can yes. actually take the organism as an example and use it as a culture for the company. So I really like them, by the way. Should we just name them just for I, our I, I audience? I think so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just something that's internal. So I just want to make sure that you're comfortable with it. But I like our mission values and our, you know. Like yeah. No, I'm, I'm ready to, to go for it. them. Go okay, for it. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we, these have evolved over, over the years. But the way they look today are there's three statements. And it's grow the future, cultivate quality, and be mycelial. Here we go. And we will we will talk about uh, Grow the Future a little bit more uh, later. And potentially we can like actually expand on that a little bit more. But I want to make sure that we go through the journey of PhD on poetry, um, giving lectures in, in Berkeley, joining an artist, creating a company, doing operations, CEO, chief of culture. And now you've been honored as one of the conscious fashion campaign leaders amongst other female leaders. After almost 10 years, like you, you are like completely impacting an industry that has very little to be like associated with what you come from. How does that feel? It's wild and amazing first. And when you look at all the remarkable women who've been named as honorees, it's humbling. And it's also really motivating because I mean, you look at projects as far ranging as Unhidden, which is a brand that is centering disability communities and experience in their designs, a, a community of you know fashion consumers that's often overlooked by the fashion industry. Yeah. Or the amazing project Saheli Women, which is giving economic opportunity and empowerment to female artisans in northern India to make and create sustainable ethical fashion. And so many other projects. I mean, you, anyone listening, go look at the list of, of honorees you see that the work that we're doing at Microworks is just one part of the whole effort and movement. And we have so much to do. And thank goodness all these other women all around the world are doing their part. And 
you know, when I get asked how I feel about being honored as an individual for these achievements, like the thing that, that I really tap into is my own personal resilience and growth and transformation that enabled me to still be participating 10 years in, but really the accolades for what we're doing today as MicroWorks, what we've managed to accomplish, like that belongs to every single person who has ever been a part of MicroWorks and ever will be. I mean, that belongs to the team. And really, I'm just one among many here. I just happen to have been here from the start, which meant that I had to adapt and evolve and keep the faith and move (laughs) through the valley of death and transform and be willing to be transformed. What was was that in the past? Any moment that you wanted to quit? Oh, yeah, for sure. So here we go. (laughs) uh, You know, a a little reward for every single moment that you wanted to quit. This, This was worth it. And most of us that are here, like, it was worth it. Yeah. And you were the face of it. So congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Thank of you. Of course. And then how does it feel to be dressed and get makeup and be in a photo <laughs> shoot? Because knowing you, a photo session, uh, knowing you, like you are, you're comfortable in stage and dancing and performing, but you have your own style. So yeah. how does it feel to be styled by someone okay. else? Okay. First, I want to say, would you ask that question of a man? And Good second, question. I want to say, it's super fun. <laughs> So, like you said, I have a background in performance, so I'm used to the, you know, rituals of costume and stage and set and director and, you know, backdrop. And so for me, I approach it like a performance opportunity and who is the audience and what is the work and what is the message that you're supposed to convey. So it's really fun and, and adaptable. And I think that that helps me move in public view with ease Mm -hmm. because I'm not attached too tightly to like, this has to be me. Cause like, what is me anyway? (laughs) You know, what is the ego? You want to go there? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Probably not. We could. Yeah, we could. Well, anyway, the idea is, you know, when I am in public or I'm, I'm doing, you know, a talk or I'm, I'm doing a performance, I'm doing it in service to something. And it's either in service to an art project, or in this case, it's in service to Micah works. And then, it's in service to our audience or to our journalists or to education, right? So who are you serving and how can you best serve them? And then the actual experience of being styled and stuff for a fancy shoot is fun. I've been telling people it's like being a race car where in between the camera clicks, you've got a team of people who like rush out and like fix you up. They're like your hair and your makeup and your outfit and then they rush back off and then you're ready to go. The level of confidence that they give you in a situation of maximum stress, it's pretty good, I have to say. So you are from the East Coast. Yes. And but I was born in Oakland. Well, I've got to say that. Born okay. in Oakland. Yeah, yeah, born in Oakland. Here we go. Raised in East Coast. Raised on East Coast, bit. yeah. And you're going to be back in September for a very important reason. What's happening in September? Well, the billboard honoring the honorees of the Conscious Fashion Campaign will be unveiled Here and it will be during New York Fashion Week and that'll be exciting. I don't think I've, I've never been on a billboard. And I mean, <laughs> many few people have been on a billboard and even less have been on a billboard on Times Square. Right, right. So that's, uh, that's uh, almost like a pinnacle moment here. Yeah, and it's, it was fun because I spent my childhood in New York City. And, of course, my community has scattered to the winds. But it'll be fun to see, like, who is like, oh, it's Sophia. <laughs> yeah, you'll be in Broadway, but for a different reason. Right? Yeah. It's, like, yeah. kind of crazy. And summarize a little bit your career, like how you've been transforming and adapting and performing at a really high level. And from the plastic arts to fashion, yeah. but you will be in Broadway. Yeah, Here yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah, I I have always liked working across different fields, and I also like surprising people. I'm really excited to see that billboard. It's gonna be bananas. <laughs> it's gonna be so much fun. So let's go back to the beginning of this conversation before we went to the photo shoot or photo session, and we we're talking about the values of the company and our mission. And you say grow the future of materials. And I have a, an intuition of what that means, but can you tell us more? What it means to you? Yeah, so grow the future of materials is the vision statement for Micah Works. And it is inspired by 
our drive, our motivation, our our intuition that we can make the things that we need in this world in a very different way from the way that we have. So there's a way that traditional materials are made or traditional goods are put together that has had a net harmful effect, whether it's on the environment or on our, you know, labor relations, you know, what it takes for people to make those things and process those things. And the idea with working with mycelium, which is an incredibly regenerative and um, beneficial natural resource in the world, is that there can be a better way of growing engineering materials that can then be the basis for products and all the things that we need for our comforts and functioning in this world that are based on something that is beneficial and and that works in better balance with our resources. Yeah. Well, and, and what do you expect the folks that work at MicroWorks to get from those statements? What do you want them to understand or to keep remembering? We are creating something that is going to be in beneficial service to the world. And the different ways that you enter into that project, whether it's someone like you as a storyteller or someone like one of our engineers or operators who's thinking very practically, like hands-on about how you make this material and design and engineer the system to make it in large amounts, that this is something that is going to benefit the systems around us and the people around us. Yeah, well, hopefully folks from Michael Wirtz can <laughs> at least <let laughs> And thank down. you. Thank yeah. you to everyone yeah, who's helping yeah, in this wow. effort. Normally, I will ask for uh, for advice to other people, but we already covered that. I remember like uh, talking to you about vulnerability in the first episode when we asked, what advice would you give to your younger self? Is there anything else that you want to add besides vulnerability or we still... Well, to, to the point that I made earlier about adapting and changing your role, that's the other thing that can be a superpower um, for longevity in any difficult and challenging and exciting effort is to always be resourceful in yourself as far as your contribution and value to the larger project because you might have an idea of yourself as well, I'm a, I'm the CEO and I should be the CEO forever. And, you know, if I had kept that mindset, we wouldn't have had the gift of bringing on Matt, who's been an amazing CEO for the company. So really my advice is to be loose and resourceful with, with who you are while maintaining a strong sense of your values and your interests and your passions. And that will take you in surprising directions. Yeah, I, I, I admire you for that to be honest, because now while you were talking, I remember that not only the CEO, the founder, you were the copywriter. Oh, yeah. I did all the writing. And I remember <laughs> 2020 when we were uh, launching Race in New York, sitting right next to you, editing copy on the fly, trying to make it. I still, <laughs> it's just like you were, you were super fluid. You were like, OK, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then I will go to the event and, and be the co-founder. So that that's pretty that's a skill that you have that not no many people I can tell have. Yeah, well you have to to have come from a very different background into another space. So how do I turn my training, you know, as an academic in literature and as a performer and a dancer and a writer, how do I, you know, leverage that in the space of a biomaterial yeah. startup? And surprisingly, in many ways, in many still ways. useful. Yeah. Yeah, 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 always, always, always. Since the last time that we talk, uh, there's been another, I mean, you've been honored with this award or this recognition, and also we launched some products. Like, how does it feel? Everything, it's, it's moving forward. Like, are you excited about the future? How do you see the, the next six months, a year from now? Oh, yeah, this is... There, there's moments when, I mean, there's never a dull moment at Microworks. I mean, you know that. <laughs> it's like yeah. very exciting all the time, learning all the time. But because we just um, broke ground on our new facility, Correct. our new and factory. A massive moment yeah, too that was forgiven. In South Carolina. And because we just launched our first, you know, well, in, in partnership with Nick Fouquet, the, the hat, the limited yeah. edition hat series. So now consumers actually are wearing hats made from reishi and, and it's out in the world. And it's just going to speed up all of that. 
And, and I'm used to those moments now after nearly 10 years in the company, like you have a large inflection point like this and then things speed up, whether it's your visibility or the demand or the interest or the partnerships. And so you just have to roll with it and also take moments to like take stock and really enjoy the accomplishments because starting to build a full scale factory that can do like millions of square feet of our material per year, which is you know, orders of magnitude more than what we're doing here in California. The work that it's taken to get there for me is already feels like a monumental success. And so that's something that we can all enjoy today. And then when we, you know, open that facility next year and we're producing our first sheets, that will be another huge milestone to really celebrate. But really it's like every single thing we do every single day already has taken so much work to get here and so many people that every day could really be a validation and celebration of what we've done. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I like the idea of taking a breather Yeah. now and then because sometimes we get into that motion, the momentum, right? Like if we don't stop to think like, whoa, what are we doing? Like <laughs> This is really difficult and mistakes will be made. But, you know, like we're learning and we're getting better at it. You know, like it's never been done before. Like that's kind of like the language that we have internally too. Like nobody's an expert of this. So we better like just keep our eyes open, ears tuned, you know, like trying to learn every day. So that's the right mindset, yeah? Yep. We normally finish our podcast with a question that can mean a lot or very little. And the question is, what sustainability means to you? Well, I'll create a nice bridge from what we were just talking about we would not be able to keep going as a company, as a team, as individuals, if we didn't do certain things to make this work, this long-term work sustainable for ourselves. So if you think about sustainability as how do you replenish as you continue producing and creating and processing your detritus, (laughs) the things that you have to leave along the way, how do you create and consume in a way that replenishes yourself and the environment that you're working with, the materials that you're working with. So there's the environmental approach to that question and and like sustainable practices approach to that question. But I like to also think about it in terms of human experience and also the experience of the living systems around us. And if we have amazing ease and comfort and wealth of materials and you know food in our corner of the world but that doesn't exist in other corners of the world is that truly sustainable so the question of sustainability for me opens up really really quickly into (sighs) very large ethical questions yes it's not that easy (laughs) i see where you're going that's where you achieve a culture (laughs) because you're thinking about ethical yeah some of the folks talk about more like the, the practicality of it and you should take what you, you know, almost keep the balance yes. to the force. But you're going to the ethical part of it and the equity and yes, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it, a difficult, <laughs> it's a it's a deep question. Like, in part, I feel comfortable doing that because I know that there are really good, smart, amazing people and efforts that are very, very fixated on the practical question of material sustainability and and sustainable manufacturing and and this company was designed to to actually do that so in the way that you evolve your contribution to a project and organism in order to complement it because i think in terms of ethical systems that's something i can contribute to round out the approach and to round out the the philosophy behind it and yeah. that affects things like how we support our workers here and the kinds of relationships that we will enter into with partners and how we can model this ethics for other companies in this space. So you're going to be challenging a little bit society in general. I think it's a, it's a way to go. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, someone has to do it, you know, if it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like we, we are in the right place and time to think that way. Not that I have to say it, you know it. It enriches the conversation, if nothing else. Yeah. Like just start there. Ask, ask some hard, good questions. Yeah. Well, we'll have more next time. Sophia, thank you so much and congratulations for your achievements. Uh, it's a pleasure to host you and hopefully we can get you back soon. Thank you so much.
thanks everyone for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it as much as I did hosting it. We are thrilled to have you with us in our journey. So if you want to learn more, please follow our Instagram page at MikeWorks for our latest news and more. This episode is being produced by Maddie Nathans, sound editing by Corny Ballardo, content editing by Chanda Loto. <laughs>